In our last section, we looked at confidence intervals for pi 1 minus pi 2. In other words, we wanted a confidence interval for the probability of success for group 1 minus the probability of success for the group of, of pro, minus the probability of success for group 2. This would be the preferred way to make inferences about pi 1 minus pi 2. Still, though, at times, some people will use a hypothesis test concerning pi 1 minus pi 2 instead. And so the purpose of this very small subsection is to look at what are the best techniques uh, to use to make these uh, inferences with a hypothesis test. So typically what we're interested in in a hypothesis test when we have pi 1 minus pi 2 is that we're looking to see is the difference equal to 0 versus is the difference not equal to 0. And uh, the, the corresponding test statistic that's used in this situation is uh, typically um, a score test. And the score test statistic is typically denoted as, or at least I will denote it as Z sub S. And this is the form pi 1 hat minus pi, um, pi 2 hat. So these again are the maximum likelihood estimators for pi 1 minus pi 2. If one wanted to, one could put zero there to emphasize that we are making a hypothesis test about um, if the difference is equal to zero. And then in the denominator, we have a square root, where in the square root we have pi bar. Pi bar represents the maximum likelihood estimate for pi 1 and pi 2 if the null hypothesis was true. Now, no, if the null hypothesis is true, of course, pi 1 would be equal to pi 2. So what we could do then is pull together across group 1 and group 2 our sample values to come up with a maximum I could estimate. And that's essentially what's done here where we take w plus divided by n plus. In other words, w1 plus w2 over n1 plus n2. So that's what pi bar is. It's the maximum likelihood estimate of pi 1 and pi 2 if the null hypothesis was true. We take pi bar times 1 minus pi bar times 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. That's my test statistic of interest. And in fact, I won't be surprised if many of you have seen this before in an introductory stat course. You just might not have known that it's actually a score statistic. In this particular setting, if the absolute value of z sub s is greater than the 1 minus alpha divided by 2 quantile from a standard normal distribution, then we reject the null hypothesis. So we're using a standard normal approximation to this test statistic here. Using the standard normal approximation as well, one could use regular methods to find them the corresponding p-value. It would be something like 2 times the probability, a standard normal random variable, let's just call it generically as z, is greater than whatever I observe my test statistic uh, to be. Uh, and that would be an absolute value of that test statistic. Okay. <clears throat> Now, there are more general versions of this test statistic as well, um, and this typically is not of interest in, in most problems. Instead of having a zero um, as the hypothesized value, you could have, let's say, just generically 0 0.1, 0 0.2, how about we just call it point, uh, how about we just call it D for difference? And this is what our test statistic would look like. Uh, this typically is not of interest in any problems, except for if you're interested in forming a uh, confidence interval based upon this statistic uh, by inverting the test. Now, another way to perform this hypothesis test is to use what's known as the Pearson chi-square test statistic. And this is... Uh, Pearson chi-square tests are general tests that, that are used in many different problems. Um, and the general form of the test statistic of interest relative to a contingency table is as follows. For one cell of the contingency table, you take what the observed count was, and you subtract off what that count should be if the null hypothesis was true. In other words, the estimated expected count under the null hypothesis. 
you subtract the two to see how far apart they are. So you if uh, and, and then you square it. So in that numerator there, as you might expect that if the null hypothesis is true, this observed count should be close to the estimated expected count under the null hypothesis. So this numerator of this part here should be small. However, if the null hypothesis is false, you would expect their difference uh, between the two to be large. In the denominator there, we divide by the estimated expected count. And what this allows one to do is to take into account the numerical scale, essentially, of what's being in the, uh, in the, in the numerator. So again, the denominator has the estimated expected count. So we do that for actually each cell of our contingency table. We form this kind of a um, statistic, and then we sum up all these values across all the cells, and that ends up being your Pearson chi-square statistic, named after uh, the person who developed it, a guy by the name of Pearson. So to put in the context now, specifically for our problem of interest, here's our two by two table that we've seen before. So here's the observed counts in the two by two portion of the table. And what would be then the expected cell count for, let's say, row one, column one? Well, if the null hypothesis was true, we know, based upon what I mentioned before, that the probability of being in column one, given you're in group one, would be pi bar. That's what it would be estimated to be under the null hypothesis. And so if I have that count then, how about we just take it times n1, I'm sorry, if I have that probability, what if I just take it times n1 so that now I have now an estimated expected count if the null hypothesis is true. And so this is what then this estimated expected count would be. In a similar manner for this particular cell here, we would take pi bar times n2. So if I have a probability of success that's estimated to be pi bar, and if the null hypothesis is true, then how about we just take it times the number of trials for that second group. And there you get your estimated expected count. Notice how this is very similar to what we first saw for a binomial distribution, where the binomial distribution has an expected value of the number of trials times the probability of success on each trial. It's the same concept. Now we're just working with this pi bar instead. Now, for these particular columns here, how do we find those? Well, now what we do is we take n, um, actually let's do this one here, n1 times 1 minus pi bar and n2 times 1 minus pi bar to get this estimated expected count under the null hypothesis. Then once we have those estimated expected counts, we can form our statistic. So again, we take the observed count minus this, its estimated expected count, we square it, divide by the estimated expected count. We do that for all four cells of the table. So this part here is for row J. Um, actually, excuse me, let me rewrite that. Okay, unfortunately my eraser is not working, so let me get a different eraser out. So what I do here is I form what this for column one and column two so that I can get the whole value for row J. I form the statistic for each cell again of the contingency table. Since I have it for row J, I can sum over my different rows so that I can go from row one to row two. That's my statistic x squared. That's my Pearson chi-square test statistic. Now we can do a little bit of algebra here to simplify far further and we can get this statistic here where I take my cell count minus what I expected to be under the null hypothesis. Um, this obviously is corresponding to column one but when we do the algebra we, we don't have that column two necessarily appearing as prominently as what we had over here and I end up dividing by 
uh, what looks pretty much like a binomial variance. I sum this then across the rows of my table. Now, for some of you who have seen a Pearson chi-square test statistic before, you might think, well, geez, this looks a little bit different from what I learned. In the end, it's exactly the same. Um, later in this course, um, and later in my book in chapter 3, we will learn the equivalences between what the common way of representing the statistic is uh, versus what I'm actually representing it here as. Now, for a large sample, if we think of this test statistic as a random variable, it has an approximate chi-square 1 distri distribution, so degrees of freedom of 1. Large values indicate Evans against the null hypothesis, so we would say reject HO if x squared is greater than the 1 minus alpha quantile from this chi-square 1 distribution. Well, why do large values and only large values indicate evidence against the null hypothesis? Well, it comes back up to here. The way that we formed our statistic, and I kind of alluded to this before, is we take the observed count minus what we expect it to be under the null hypothesis. If this difference is small, then it says, okay, the null hypothesis is um, maybe correct. And so what that's going to end up being, or what's going to end up happening, is that uh, for each cell that this is calculated for, these values are going to be small. When you add them up, you still have a small number, and so therefore you would not reject HO. However, if there is evidence against the null hypothesis, or let's say the null hypothesis is actually false, meaning um, pi 1 does not equal pi 2, then this observed count is going to be a lot different from the estimated expected count, and so that's going to lead to having large numbers in this sum. And these large numbers then, when added up, will be a large number, and therefore uh, you will get something for your test statistic that would be unusual to have if actually the null hypothesis was, was true. So that's why we would reject for a large value. Now, interestingly, one can actually show, I'm not going <clears> to <throat> ask this on a test, one can actually show that if I were to square that score statistic value, I get my chi-square, Pearson chi-square test statistic value. So that's kind of interesting. And also, for those of you who have taken a mathematical statistics course before, you will know from that class that a square of a standard normal random variable is exactly the same as a chi-square 1 random variable. So because of this, then, what happens with the score tests is going to be exactly the same as what happens with the Pearson chi-square test, meaning that you're going to get the same conclusion, the same result of reject or don't reject HO. So these tests are equivalent. So let's go ahead and look at an application of this uh, testing method. We're going to come back to the Larry Bird data once again. I'm going to put my data into a contingency table in R that I decide to call c.table. Again, I could call it something else if I want to. The function that allows us to form the contingency table in R is the array function. In the data argument, I put my, my data in by rows. I specify my dimension of my contingency table. And then the dimension names, I list first the row name and then the column name with their certain particular levels. So there's my data. And I'm interested in performing this hypothesis test. Pi 1 minus pi 2 is equal to 0 versus not equal to 0. Well, what does this mean in terms of this particular data set? Well, what this is saying is, is that the probability of success in terms of the, let, let me restate this, what the null hypothesis is saying here is that the probability of a made second free throw is not dependent on whether the first free throw is made or missed because the probability of making the free throw, the probability of success, would be exactly the same. Pi 1 would be equal to pi 2. So to do these calculations, if we were to, let's say, want to do them by hand, I can form my pi bar as the sum 
of my two um, uh, counts here in column one corresponding to a made second free throw. Take that sum divided by the total number of trials and get 0.8846. Again, this is, the, this is the maximum I could estimate of the probability of success if the null hypothesis was true. Then using this information, I can form my test statistics. So I have pi hat 1 minus pi hat 2, 0.88 minus 0 0.9057. For emphasis here, I just put a 0. You don't need to do that. I just did it here. I put in my value of pi bar, put in number of trials for row 1 and for row 2 I get a test statistic of negative 0.522 we can see that if I were to use alpha 0.05 the test statistic value is between my two critical values or another way to put it is if I were to have negative 0.5222 it is less than my critical value of 1.96 if I did the absolute value there. So therefore I do not reject HO, meaning that there's not sufficient evidence to conclude the probability of success on the second free throw. It differs based upon what happens on the first free throw. Now note that this doesn't mean that these that pi 1 is actually equal to pi 2. All this means, and this is the standard interpretation for a hypothesis test, is that from this sample itself we cannot conclude that there's a difference. So another way uh, to do all this here is that we can go to R. We can use a function called prop.tests. Uh, this is in the default installation of R, in particular in the stats package. I can put in for my x argument, my contingency table. I put my confidence level, of, um, let's say 0.95, that's my 1 minus alpha. And then I specify correct equal false. What that corresponds to is that, unfortunately, by default, the prop.test will make a small adjustment to the numerator of the test statistic. It actually, um, uh, um, I think it, it subtracts a particular constant uh, that's rel relatively small with uh, where the ultimate goal is to get a better approximation for a, the probability distribution of the test statistic. In the end, that... Um, that constant is actually not needed. Um, I wish R wouldn't have that by default. Unfortunately, it does. And so correct equal true is the default. And so that's why we will always use correct equal false. Then what R gives us is actually the X square statistic, our Pearson chi-square test statistic. Uh, it even gives a p-value as well. And so this would be calculated as if I had, let's say, suppose A has a... Um, has a chi-square 1 distribution, the probability that A is greater than 0.2727 is equal to 0.6015. Just using the basic ideas of um, critical values for a hypothesis test versus p-values for a hypothesis test that you would see in intro stat course. And so this also means then that the square of Z sub S is 0.2727. Um, in this particular case, we see that the p-value is large. We see that the test statistic is less than, although I don't have it here, a chi-square 1 with 0 0.95, um, um, 0.95 quantile for my test statistic. This would be 3.84. How can I figure that out? I use the q, q chi sq function in R. I would put 0.2727 there with um, uh, one degree of freedom. Let me actually go ahead and do that. Just to show you. Actually, I actually unfortunately miswrote that. Sorry about that. Should have just been doing all this in R to begin with. So I could use the QKISQ function with the P argument standing for probability, the probability you're to the right of the quantile, 0.95, DF for degrees of freedom, a DF is equal to 1, and I get my quantile to be 3.84. Okay.
So the test statistic is small relative to the critical value. The p-value is large, so therefore I would say don't reject HO. We do not have sufficient evidence that uh, that um, that uh, what happens on the first attempt has an effect on what happens uh, in terms of the probability of success or the probability of making that second attempt. Now, what is the actual value of z sub s here? Well, re remember, again, the square of that gives me my Pearson statistics. That means z sub s is either the positive square root of 0.2727 or the negative square root of 0.2727. Well, which one is it, though? Well, this is where you can go to your output, and you see here's where pi hat 1 is, and here's pi hat 2. We've actually calculated that in the past in a different way. And we can see that in the numerator for z sub s, I would take pi hat 1 minus pi hat 2. And we see that pi hat 2 is greater than pi hat 1 there. So because of that, z sub s is the negative of the square root of uh, 0.2727, which we've actually found before to be negative 0.52. Okay. There's another commonly used function R that does this hypothesis test for us as well, or does the calculations for it. It's called the chi-sq.test function, where in the x argument I put in uh, my contingency table, and again, unfortunately, it the function uh, puts a little bit of a, a correction in the numerator. Uh, it's actually called a continuity correction. Uh, it does it by default. We don't need that, so we'd say correct equal false, and we get the same values as before. There are other ways to actually perform this hypothesis test that I'm not going to go into here. One in particular is using a likelihood ratio test. Why am I not going into it in detail? Well, statistical research has shown that the Pearson chi-square test, or equivalently the score test in this particular situation, uh, is better uh, to use than the likelihood ratio test. So this ends in this uh, small section on uh, doing hypothesis tests for pi 1 minus pi 2.